Right, because now we have Reclaim Your Face, biometric mass surveillance and how we can act against it. Uh, this will be presented by two interesting colleagues. Uh, on the one hand, we have Kantorkel, certified teleshopping ultra, as I've heard from Hamburg, who is involved with Freifunk as well, and, uh, and he is involved in the Reclaim Your Face initiative and is a kind of a driving force behind it, to, and it's always good to have those. And number two of that duo in finale that we have is Vic. One or other of you, as soon as they see the image, will think, well, I've seen him on TV, haven't I, on the, this electro-punk band that uh, always connects privacy awareness with punk, kind of the best combination you could imagine, system, system upstools or system crash in English, that's the setup, and he will be giving part of this talk. So at this point, before I spoiler it all, let's get you involved and give you an applause and the stage is yours. Thank you for that nice introduction. I am Kantok, I am Vic, hi, and we are going to tell you about biometric mass surveillance in Germany and a little in Europe as well, and then we will talk about the initiative Reclaim Your Face. Uh, as a short reminder, this is about biometric data. These are data that relate to our body or our behavior and describe it. That could be our fingerprint, our face, but these data can also be about the way we walk, for example, or the way we type on a keyboard. And these data, in principle, are unique, so we could be identified using these data and they are normally not changeable, constant across time, and they are measurable and universal. And the problem is that the, that the technologies used for biometric surveillance are often discriminating, discriminatory and error-prone, and we have a certain belief in technology, of course, always, and that makes it dangerous. If you have a surveillance camera that claims to be intelligent, and if that device tells us, oh, we have a criminal walking around here and I then imprison that person and later realize that person, that person wasn't a criminal at all, then that is not good. And the whole thing is also dangerous because it's hard for me to protect myself or hide from biometric surveillance. I can't really change my face in a significant way and if I change it somewhat, a little, then it won't help. I've brought a few pictures along. That's one person, sometimes with longer hair, sometimes shorter, sometimes older, sometimes with makeup or with a beard. That all does not help to protect that person against biometric recognition and just as much a face mask that we now use due, due to the pandemic a lot, that doesn't help you much either. So this is about biometric data, and in Germany, biometric data is experimented with in the public arena. So all of us are turned into guinea pigs without, ask, without us being asked. Many people know the example from the Berlin Südkreuz station, a regional station, where the police wanted to play around with recent technology. This experiment started in 2017, and the police were fairly happy with the result, but the results were doctored quite a lot, and they were only really usable under ideal conditions for the imaging, and if several systems would take the images and would be combined, which normally in practice you would not do. So, in, actually, in reality, this experiment was a failure, but still, in 2020, there was an exchange between Berlin uh, um, federal police in Berlin and a similar experiment at the airport of Prague in the Czech Republic, where similar technologies were tried. We tried to obtain information about this exchange using freedom of information requests, and we had members of parliament that were kind enough to ask the questions for us as well, but we did not get any information. So all we know is that in 2020 there was an exchange between the airport of Prague and the police in Berlin, the transport police or federal police, 
but we don't really know what was being talked about. But we still do know that the police said in 2020 that uh, face recognition can be used in regular practice, and they said that this was shown through the results in the 2017 experiment. But with uh, the current legal situation, no further exchange of information with Czech police is being planned. The experiment has finished, but in the background, apparently things are still happening, but it's very difficult to obtain transparency and information. Another not so nice topic is the G20 summit that took place in Hamburg in 2017. During the summit and after it, police uh, had more than 100 terabytes of image and video material, material and uh, a large part of that was biometrically processed as well, and that again was without asking the people concerned. So police simply went ahead and processed very sensitive data and probably without a legal foundation either there's a legal dispute about that still going on the video material was from various sources cameras from underground stations were tapped into public transport cameras in buses as well but there was also a portal where people could upload their private videos so all kinds of data were uh, processed with a certain software uh, in retrospect and analyzed biometrically. So normal imaging material was used where no biometrics was actually involved in the recording, but then in ret afterwards it was processed and analyzed biometrically. And the Data Protection Commissioner didn't find that so funny and ordered police in Hamburg to delete these data but the police ignored that. They thought they were in, in, the, in the clear legally, and the Data Protection Commissioner was not able to enforce anymore, which is why there is still a legal dispute, I think, at the higher administrative court in Hamburg, still pending, and I hope that soon we will see that what police did back then was not legal. Another nice topic, also from 2017, uh, that's at least when it started, was the face search engine Clearview AI. This search engine was got, got known in 2020 because there was a report in the New York Times that was the first one to report about this at large scale. So three million pictures on the internet were searched biometrically and analyzed, and as a service, this search engine was not only uh, made available for law enforcement, but also to rich people as a toy who would perhaps upload people from passers-by, and this search engine would then point out all various places where this that same face could be found on the internet and that is exactly the problem the engine doesn't look for similar pictures but similar faces so if i using a standard search engine would upload a current picture or to to have it searched for i would probably not find a similar uh, f face, but using Clearview AI, I can upload a current picture and the face would then be noticed and analyzed and then the search engine would show me all kinds of findings on the internet where that same face had appeared earlier. So this search engine provides a technology where uh, it could happen to me that I, I am standing around at some rally and I could just go ahead and identify everyone present at the same rally uh, as long as these people would have appeared somewhere on the internet in the last few years. I actually wrote to that search engine, actually sent them a photo of mine and asked them for a copy of my data and I uh, called on them to delete my data because, according to the GDPR, uh, face data are sensitive data and under particular protection. And I was kind of surprised when the search engine actually responded. And you see the response 
here, the first image is the one I sent to be searched for, and the images one and two actually were photos of mine that were somewhere on the internet, and then seven others were shown that did not show my face. So you can see here again, even Clearview AI is not delivering perfect search results. Even there, you can have false hits. Yeah, once I had received this answer from Clevio, I, I complained to the Hamburg Data Protection Authority and there was a bit of a back and forth because I thought that they would be responsible because due to the GDPR and the uh, protection authority, Data Protection Authority thought that the GDPR would not be applicable. We did agree on a position in the end and a procedure was opened and supported through the NGO None of Your Business. We we managed to get Clearview AI in February 2021, so after about one year, that they would delete, that they would ha they'd had to delete my personal data. And it was also found that the processing of the data had been illegal, at least in the European Union. The problem was, though, that I had to complain and only my biometric data would, was subsequently deleted. And even though we know that many other Europeans are in this database and therefore affected, the order by the Hamburg Data Protection Authority only affected my person. So again, we are still looking how uh, and what can be done. Clearview AI, sadly, is not the only face search engine by far these days. PIM Eyes is another one, originally from Poland. This has existed since 2019. You see the two founders. Uh, these two don't want to be shown on the internet so much, but the two faces seem to be, they, their two faces seem to be on a blacklist. If you use these in that same search engine, you used to get results and you no longer do. And when the first protests occurred, the uh, company relocated very quickly from Wroclaw Wroclaw to the Seychelles Islands. But still, there is a company that is somehow connected to these two people. Uh, you see the address on the slide. So if you have connections to that area, we would be very interested about information of what is happening in these offices right now, because it could be very interesting if PIM is de facto still has a subsidiary in the European Union or a branch. And what was also interesting is that if that we could get new allies because police trade unions don't like face recognition that much either, at least not if everyone can use these services because the, and, and that's why the police trade unions want PIM eyes to be outlawed. And with that, I'll hand over to Victor. Right. Um, we are going to continue with our overview of what is going on in Germany. We prepared a best of of biometric surveillance projects just to give you a picture of what's happening, starting with Mannheim. In Mannheim, since 2018, there is behavior recognition in the pedestrian area in the center. And we've kind of uh, tallied up according to where does it happen, what is happening. So the people that operate this is the Mannheim local police, and they say, no, there's no problem, no privacy problem, because there's no identification, just recording of conspicuous behavior, so the police can be sent out quickly. And this is solved by allegedly having a very minimal uh, procedure where all the faces are pixelated immediately, so people don't see who is actually behaving conspicuously, but only that a behavior is occurring, and a police uh, patrol can then go there. But of course, to pixelate images, I have first have to recognize images. So to some sense, I have to have processed biometric data. They do say they do need a legal foundation, and probably there is no legal foundation. I think there is no agreement there yet, and uh, it should be possible to clarify this in the future, but it, you are allowed to remain skeptical. And similarly, in Karlsruhe, uh, that is still planned. The cameras haven't been installed yet, but there are some interesting 
things here because a behavioral analysis project is to take place in the public arena, not run by police though, but by a company. The uh, electricity provider in the federal state of Baden-Württemberg and they again say this is all okay, it's all anonymized, not about people and they and all the laws that regulate personal data do not apply here. We tried to uh, get more information through freedom of information laws. The city says we can't say anything, there are no contracts yet, so this is continuing to be interesting but something seems to be happening. Let's move on to the state of Saxonia and the have a whole zone here, not just a dot, and that is because the police law in the federal state of Saxonia, the, there is an authorization to survey the whole border zone to the Czech Republic and use face recognition there to the Czech Republic and Poland, I should say, and um, this is to find and uh, <coughs> punish misbehavior, and I don't know about a single camera having been installed but the legal foundation has been installed and the uh, Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte uh, who uh, engages in strategic litigation has said they would uh, pursue this. And uh, on to Cologne in our round trip. There are no cameras in Cologne yet, cameras that recognize faces, but there are many cameras in Cologne which are quite high quality. So they often are biometric ready, as they say. So through their specifications, they are so good that they, without any further ado, could be repurposed to a system that does face recognition, not to the police control room, and that could get face recognition going immediately. And against these very high quality cameras in Cologne, there is an organization, camerasstoppen.org, stopcameras.org. They've had some successes, so they are trying to get these cameras banned through legal procedures. And um, we, so, <clears throat> bottom line, more and more dots and, and, and points, uh, uh, objects are turning up on this map. And all in all, you can say there are cameras here that may not be able to recognize faces yet, but in principle, the first steps have been made for towards biometric face recognition because as cameras, they would be able to be that link in the chain and many people are really keen. Many people are really have really have itching fingers to, to start on this. Polices, ministries really want to try these technologies. So it's high time to get active because in principle you could say, hey, let's look at this map, there's more and more. If we keep still for 10 years, we'll have, we'll have it everywhere. So this is just an extrapolation into the future. Now, from these cameras, you could draw further dots. It becomes much more scary if you look at Europe because there are so many projects there that within the space of this talk, I would not be able to introduce all of them. All of them. Uh, you can just scan through them and the best of normally, if it's about face recognition, uh, this has been used to recognize people at public demonstrations or rallies, the one, that the, the one thing that we are most afraid of because that is the highest damage to democracy if people cannot be go to rallies uh, demonstrations without being identified. So that has happened in Austria and many other countries have uh, entered into contracts. Greece, for example, bought face recognition systems for 4 million. Netherlands uh, paid 1.3 million. They have 1.3 million in a database, people that is. We have schools in some countries. Belgium has tracked airports. Slovenia has identified demonstrators. Sweden could not resist to use Clearview AI, although that probably was illegal. In Belgrade and Serbia, uh, systems were put in place. It's a long list. And you can see the map is turning more and more blue. This is turning up everywhere and it's spreading fast. And those that follow this, follow European politics closely and security laws can just uh, consider who is missing. Uh, people that like to get creative, of course, Frontex. Frontex is very keen too. The European European Border and Coast Guard Agency, 
So it, I think they don't really have the technology yet, but it's documented that, uh, that they're really keen to enter that kind of arms race and invest money. And, uh, well, <clears throat> they are buying weaponry, but also digital surveillance technology, which often is dual use for the military, <clears throat> or at, at least produced for dual, dual use as well. It's about face recognition, pattern recognition, behavior recognition, lie detectors, fingerprinting that is supposed to be taken from all non-EU citizens that are going in or coming out. <clears throat> so they would like to get involved heavily and what else do we have? <clears throat> well, let's just get into a small overview and summary of the whole situation. Uh, face recognition as such is kind of the escalation of video surveillance. Video surveillance is an intrusion into people's rights already, and video surveillance can produce chilling effects. That is what you call the negative effects of surveillance mechanisms, and it means that people then restrict themselves. So if you have a feeling that if I do this, then uh, the information could be detrimental to me in the future, then maybe I won't go to this demonstration. That happens with video surveillance, so it's not that great already, but it's getting much worse with face recognition just through scaling effects, because face recognition, uh, sorry, video surveillance at a underground station, for example, where you have a conventional camera, you may feel watched, but you still have a person watching you on the other, at the other end. Now that changes with face recognition algorithms because with a normal camera, it's simply not practical practical to uh, watch a whole city across the area because you don't have enough people. So there is an upper limit about how many places and squares and, and, and you can surveil. But if you did it, digitalize all this and have an algorithm run across it, then that no longer applies, and the data format is much more precise and handy, because with video surveillance all you have is that stream, and if you consider all these cameras and store all that from all the various locations, that's a huge amount of data, but with a face recognition algorithm and good timestamps and GPS, data, and if you store all that, about who you've seen when, that is not that much. It's quite plausible to um, store this across the whole city and remember it all, because you never know, it could be useful in the future. So, beyond those scaling effects, it's much more dramatic and much more dangerous. You have real mass scale use of this technology, potentially, because there are no human factors limiting, limiting it anymore. And it's also important to say that in Germany, since the last ID card law, there is an automatic access of more or less all police authorities and secret services to the data that's already been digitized of all the passport photos or ID card photos. So the collection exists of all people in Germany with which they could be identified. So if you consider what is necessary for an, for an functioning face recognition system, it would be the good camera, they are in place, it would be a photo of the person you want to identify that does exist. And the last thing that's missing are the computers, that the analysis systems. They don't, they're not there yet, but we have to make sure that they don't come into existence. And with that, I'll hand over to Kantoko because, of course, we don't want these this to happen, and this is about the campaign. So this is the initiative Reclaim Your Face that was started in November last year. And since February 2021, it's a real official uh, citizens initiative in the EU. The aim is to uh, prohibit mass video face recognition. First of all, the situation is good. Uh, there was a leaked white paper of the EU where the regulation of uh, mass surveillance face recognition was uh, uh, talked about. In the final version, this wasn't case, the case anymore, but even in the EU, 
level people are thinking about this subject. Also, the large number of examples we have discussed is that we need to act. The technologies extend further and further. Just yesterday I read in the newspaper that a robot dog walked through Hamburg with an advanced uh, um, camera from Boston Dynamics. And if we do not want that soon, we can, if we want to ensure that we are not bio biometrically recognized everywhere, we have to act now because it might be much too late later on. This initiative requires one million signatures uh, and from at least seven countries. Um, there are limits by uh, for each country because that needs to be a European subject. But we know that it's a European subject because it was accepted. This initiative was verified by the European Union and they are only accepted if the European Union can change something there. This initiative was accepted um, you can find it under redeemyourface.eu and sign it there, and that is a first success. But the large amount of work to collect the one million signatures is still ahead of us. That's not something we do on our own, but there is a large number of different organizations that all are part of the EDRI network, um, for example, uh, yeah, some different organizations, and more than 45 organizations try to help us, and we have uh, left the data protection bubble behind ourselves. Amnesty Inter uh, International is part of it. Um, but German Watch TV, for example, and in European level, the a different organization um, with more than 7 million members. That's a large, wide network that it is still in growing. We have 46,000 signatures, more than half of which are from Germany. That's like a lot, but we are quite far away from the 1 million. But we are quite sure that we can reach that aim because the we, we are still growing. The initiative is still growing. In recent weeks, we were looking at finding new partners, mostly political organizations, uh, some of which want to support us. And we wrote a lot of ask the government questions to get more information about surveillance government, but more and more uh, the organizations that would are required to publish the data but are not willing to give us the data because they claim they do not have the documents. Uh, we just started, so it's um, a large challenge. How can we work for a complete year? We will have subject weeks. Um, we have different specific subjects we are going to talk about with who work in that area. For example, uh, soccer stadiums, because that is something is, uh, that's a group that is hard hit by it if it ever created. People who fl uh, flee Frontex wants to use that, but we also know that Frontex wants to use technologies that's not that good for those people who are, are most hardly hit. Another group is uh, the surveillance and the workplace, for example, the Amazon. Uh, but there are a lot of 
subject areas we need to look at and we need to build a colorful and large organization uh, or, or initiative where as many people as possible outside of the data protection area uh, are participants. So if you ask, if, if you want to participate, um, First of all, it's great to create transparency. We, there are many areas we do not know about. If ask organizations about your data, ask organizations that might have used face recognition, ask them, hey, what did you do? Why? How do you take care of that? Is that biometric data for you? Because biometric data are need to be protected. And also, so ask public organizations, ask creative questions. We are always looking for documents you find because we know there are many more interesting things to do. You need to read news and ask information freedom requests. Questions. Another thing. Um, create publicity. Many people in different organizations may not think about face recognition. If you are able to talk with your local representatives, because that way you tell, show them that you are looking at it and that you think it's not working that well. And last point, perhaps join our self-organized session to help people who listen to this and want to participate. We have a self-organized session. We have entered a self-organized session here on the R2R Monday, 15.30. And you're all welcome to join us there. If you want to participate in the campaign, if you know an organization that really, really should be part of it, we can talk about it there. And with that, we are at the end of the talk. Here, this is how you can contact us. And yes, thank you for your... Thank you for listening. So, a great applause for our presenters. Uh, I was uh, well, I can see that there are many questions pouring into the pad, so I think you've hit a nerve there. So, I'm just going to scroll into the pad and ask the first question. Uh, from my point of view, all steps and actions taken so far against this madness are too soft. What can be done in a sustainable way? Can you break this somehow? <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. Maybe it would help to make this surveillance more visible and get this onto the streets. That uh, would be good, but of course there are reasons for that to be kind of difficult. And what is also, I think the tool of the European Citizens Initiative uh, isn't that bad either. If we reach the limits, then there has to be a public hearing and the Commission has to uh, provide a written statement about whether they are going to implement our aims or why not, if not. So we have pressure that, to create that way. Are there actions against Clearview AI already? Is it worth to ask to, to hand in more of these deletion requests? Yes, without a doubt. I did this once, it took me over a year, but now it's very clear how this should be done. So if you want, if, if you get responses, I would love to hear them and we'll see what we can do with them. Can I have Clearview AI delete? my photos are there templates for that for, for, for that kind of request ah the company isn't in the EU so probably there is no uh, lever that like we can pull 
<clears throat> yes, true, that is difficult. In my case, all that we reached was that the biometric data concerning my face was deleted, but not the copies of pictures. We didn't hear about this, but we're not finished with this yet. Just for understanding, isn't it the case with GDPR that as long as the service is offered in the EU, uh, you are <clears throat> you are affected by the law, yes, that is true, uh, but officially there are no European customers, Swedish police had to pay 250,000 as a fine, I think. Mannheim, what is classified as conspicuous behavior to make the police show up and take a look? Yeah, that is an interesting question, because that is not so well documented, and that is another threat of these automatic procedures, because either there is no transparency when it is triggered, or the people don't actually know themselves. There is a kind of magic foo AI there, and I think the talk was about uh, public scuffles, someone runs away after a theft, or uh, hits someone, punches someone. So, um, but that could be misconstrued. If, if it's a if it's a hug, it might be construed as a scuffle. So, if it would be open source, that would be nice, perhaps. But it would be even better if these systems didn't exist at all. Yeah. Then video surveillance in the border zone. Is it use? Is it a normal thing that basic rights are softened 30 kilometers away from the border? How do they reach this 30 kilometer figure? How they reach this 30 kilometer figure, I don't really know. And in the European area, it would it was not normal to <coughs> kind of. <coughs> dilute your basic laws, and this is Saxony, right? And someone actually linked to an article on the German Wikipedia about the custom uh, border areas, and I think in these areas, I live near, I come from a place near the Dutch border, and I think there are ways there to have the police get more involved. I think, I don't know if that is connected with the 30 kilometers. Now, how do you see the topic or the issue of passengers in an autonomous car sharing vehicle? Would it be wrong to perhaps recognize sexual uh, uh, assaults automatically in a place like that? Well, uh, I, I didn't get the answer. Um, yes. But it's, it's also interesting that you have so many cameras in cars looking out these days. Uh, and uh, do European countries exchange these data already, share them? Is there any concrete knowledge about this, for example, for following people? Uh, I'm sure that for police searches, images are exchanged, whether that is connected to biometric processing, I don't know. How? What is the best way to convince your friends to sign this petition? Well, maybe uh, just point to how urgent the issue is, and many people don't actually know that is some, that something is happening, and many people don't know that the, there's a problem there. And my, in my experience, the most imp important thing is to talk about the urgency. Why does it have to happen right now? Because there are always 20 other things that are going on. So it's important to tell, to, to talk to them about the fact that there is two things. Uh, the, the, all of Europe is simply itching to get involved in, in this technology, and if we don't act now, then for at least 10 years the system will be in place. If you look at the history of intrusions into basic laws in Germany, even if it was not uh, legal under the Constitution, it takes about 10 years up until a procedure, a complaint at the Constitutional Court is processed, and that is the amount of time that the technology will be there to prevent this from happening for at least 10 years, if not all the time, and for us to get to, to feel monitored all the time. The logical and best consequence is to take action now. And that's what you should say. And maybe just share the link from media.ccd.de with this very talk, because uh, that would be a very good way to get involved. 
Next, is there a list of companies that you could ask? Uh, do you prepare a how-to in the self-organized session? And is there a documentation about this? Are you going to do a how-to? A list of companies we don't have yet. We have started to collect names, but I think we are a long way from a complete list. And the self-organized session will be about how to concretely approach such a company, find one of them, and then approach them. The next question, I think, is an impulse that I find interesting. What does Zoom do? Is that a biometric mass experiment with all the data that is handed to them? Zoom is the ideal goldmine for faces, voices, eye colors, skin colors, next to behavior, uh, connected to an immense cont content fund, what the people talk about. So the Zoom terms actually uh, um, provide for the data to be further protest. Well, I don't want to speculate about Zoom's intentions, but for reasons they are very coy about the, them being present in the EU. So the EU protection authorities are still not in agreement about who is actually responsible to deal with Zoom, because Zoom simply doesn't tell them what the situation is. And I think you can imagine the rest. Yeah, parts of the answer would be disconcerting, to quote or uh, misquote a, a German interior minister who used that phrase to not respond at some point about something else. Uh, uh, what about humorous actions about cameras? Well, there is this pandemic, but um, we still plan to do things on the streets in various cities. So everyone not in Berlin, not in a large city, you may think, well, it would be cool to have something happening in our city. Talk to us, because we have plans about decentralized photo actions and get things onto the streets. So please join us for that. And a concrete case in the center of Chemnitz in Saxony, there are too many high-resolution cameras, those with the eight objectives, and they were installed against the resistance of the town council. How can I <clears throat> enter into legal proceedings to, to get them removed? We would love to get in touch with kamerasstoppen.org, stopcameras.org. Okay, I think we've just hit the time mark exactly. I have a few notes. So the link to Reclaim Your Face and other links. And we had a feedback saying that this was a very nice talk, very well done. So I think I'm just going to repeat this. Thank you very much. And Vic and Kantorke, and not just for the talk, but also for the work you do on this, because what you, as you said, we have to get other people infected to sign this petition, and we need a mutation. We need a DVOG R to R mutation, a virus that uh, gets you to talk with people and, and gets you to say to people uh, that they should sign and, and spread that around the world. <laughs> Uh, viral, yeah, it should go viral, exactly. So, thank you very much for your talk, Reclaim Your Face, Biometric Mass Surveillance and How We Can Defend Against It. So, I'm going to wave into the cameras and I'll have a few.